ring true because of what you're learning and what the Bible is teaching. And today we're going to tackle a, a subject, and as a matter of fact, for the next couple of weeks, that may seem mundane to some of you. Uh, but without all of us understanding what I'm about to share today and, and next week, none of the later presentations will have of any significance. And so I hope that you pay attention today and, and, and if you're going to follow along with the Bible verses, you're going to have to write them down because we're going to go through a lot of Bible verses today uh, because once again, I can't make a point without letting it speak for itself. And of course, before I even say anything anymore, I just like for us to pray. So Father in heaven, we invite you here at this time into the homes of all those who are watching Lord, they've taken this time out of their day, a beautiful, beautiful Saturday, and they're sitting in front of their TV, their computer, maybe even out on the porch, enjoying the nice weather. And Father, we are hungry. All of us, we are hungry for your word. We are hungry for the truth. We are hungry for a message that will be meaningful, relevant, and give us strength to face the challenges that we face every day. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for giving us this opportunity. And I pray that you will anoint my mouth and anoint the ears of those who are listening that none of this will come from me, but it will come from you. Amen. Before I get into the sermon today, <clears throat> um, I do need to make a few clarifications in regards to the sermon last week. I sometimes I get excited, and uh, like I said, my wife does the correction of the English in order for my mom to be able to do the correction of the French translation. And so I got two people who were filtering every word that I say. And so they came up with a few mistakes that I made last week. And so I just want to clarify that for you. I did mention at one point last week that the temple that was destroyed in 7080 was Solomon's temple. That is incorrect. Solomon built the first, the, was it? Uh, anyhow, it, it, was, it was Herod who had built the temple at that time and erected it. And so he was the one that uh, had erected that temple. And that's the one that was destroyed in 70 AD. Also, another thing that I had mentioned, and this is quickly in passing, that 27, in, in 27 AD, Jesus was 27 years old. We don't know that. The date 27 AD was set all the way back in Daniel chapter 9 as the date that Jesus will be baptized. But whether or not he was 27, the jury is still out. Some people say that the 0 AD date is either two years too late or five or six years too late, which means that it would make Jesus older than 27 when he was baptized and also when he died. We don't know exactly how old he was, but we can know for certainty that in 27 AD, he was baptized, and in 31 AD, he died on the cross. And in 34 AD is when the gospel went to the Gentiles. So I just wanted to clarify that with you. Um, I'm not a historian, and I will make some mistakes, so I, I'm happy for you to point those out. There was a few other people who had a few other concerns in regards to the, the sanctuary and the priestly robes and all that, and I did dig deeper into it a little bit. But uh, I, I'm uncertain about some of those things, and so sometimes it's better not to just get into too, too much of that. But today, uh, we're going to tackle what I said again, probably the most conflicting subject in religion today, and that is the law. And I say this because <clears throat> as, I, as I've traveled in different places in the world, I have experienced different religions as I went to school in the States when I was younger, I've also experienced many different denominations from Southern Baptist to United to, to Baptist to Seventh-day Adventist to Atheism and then also Confucianism as I've traveled to different parts, Buddhism and Hinduism. And I can tell you that this little word right here, this three-letter word has been Satan's weapon in creating confusion when it comes to God. I want you to understand the Bible for yourself. And as we begin the ne these next four weeks, if there's anything that I really want you to do is this. Don't just take what I say and believe it. Go to the Bible and research it 
for yourself. Do your research. Check the Bible and make sure many verses support what you believe and what I say. And if what I'm sharing is not in the Bible, then this should be the last sermon you listen to from me. You'll be surprised. You'll be surprised as to what people teach about this three little word, three letter word. I beg of you, stop believing without searching. Stop believing without searching. I find that when most people don't search, they will go with the most charismatic preacher. They will go with the church with the nicest music. They will go to the website with the the most attractive colors. They will go with the loudest or what makes the more sense. And I hope that by now you've understood that the Bible and the Bible alone is what I trust. And I hope that you've seen over the last seven weeks that the Bible speaks to intelligent people. Not people who are swayed by the wind of change and by their emotions and what they think looks and sounds good. I hope that for some of you, you may not have had that much experience in the Bible, but that things are starting to make sense. Keep dedicating this time on Saturday mornings, and I can tell you that by the time we're done, you will know how to make the right decision for your life. You'll be surprised as to what the world teaches about the law and even more surprisingly is what Christianity teaches about the law. But it doesn't matter what they say. It matters what the Bible says. And I have many Christians who are listening to this series. I just ask for you this morning to just pray that he removes any preconceived ideas from your mind and that you let the Bible speak to your heart today. You know, as wicked as the world can be, I find it ironic that it's also a very, very religious world. In North America, we have more churches, more pastors, and more members than ever before. Yet, If you look at some of these numbers, it's mind-boggling. Why are our morals so low? Why is it that crimes in America are increasing nine times faster than the population is increasing? I mean, 60% of North Americans have been subject to a major crime in their life at least once. One out of seven children are sexually abused in their childhood. And we have some, in North America, they have on their, in the United States, they have on their money, in God we trust. Over 50,000 people a year commit suicide in North America. That's the United States and Canada. 60% of Americans steal on a regular basis. 30% of our marriages, both in Canada and the United States, between a man and a woman commit adultery on a regular basis. 30% of marriages commit adultery. If you don't know what adultery is, it means to have a sexual relationship with someone either who is married or you as a married person have a relationship with someone else outside of your committed relationship. The average American and Canadian tells 100 lies a day. Yet, North America is one of the most religious area on earth. Something is wrong. And I believe that the answer to why that is is found in the Bible. Of course, you knew I was gonna say that, right? <laughs> Go to Second Timothy. 2 Timothy in your Bible, if you don't know where Timothy is, it's near the end, near the end. It's just uh, almost just before the book of Hebrews. And be careful, there's a 
1 Timothy, and there's a 2 Timothy. So you want to go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And just to give you a little bit of a background, this is the first time we're reading from this book. Uh, Timothy was a young man, who was a, he's a young pastor who was just beginning to work. And so Paul, who was an experienced pastor here, is writing to Timothy. So this is a letter from Paul writing to Timothy. And Timothy is facing a lot of challenges, as any new young pastor would face. Uh, probably facing disrespect, you're young, you don't know what you're doing, and then you get to churches that have been deeply entrenched and, and have elders and have people who've been there for a long time, and so here comes this young whippersnapper, and he has to deal with different situations. And so in 2 Timothy chapter 4, we begin at verse 2, I believe this is the answer as to why the world is more religious than ever, yes, and yet more wicked. This may surprise you. It says, we start in verse 2. This is Paul speaking to Timothy. Preach the word. <laughs> Preach the word. Now, some of you may not be familiar with the Bible a lot, but when he says preach the word, what does he mean? What does he mean? Use this. Not just your words, Timothy. Don't study grammar. No, preach what's in here. And look what he says. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all suffering and teaching. When you try to convince people, when you rebuke people, when you exhort people, you're going to have to experience, you're going to experience long suffering because it's not going to go well. When you preach the word, it's not going to go well. So you need patience, Timothy, because he says this. This is such an eye-opener for me. For the time will come, verse 3, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. We'll stop there. See, he doesn't say, find one verse in the Bible and preach for 45 minutes. Oh, he doesn't say, you know, have a praise team on the stage, let them sing for 45 minutes, and then share a small talk for 10 minutes. He doesn't say that pastors are supposed to be entertainers or politicians. They are to be people who preach the word of God. And the reason why we have a problem in our society today and in the world is that we are not telling people what this says. We are telling people what we want. And people are electing pastors to tell them the things they want to hear. And if you pay me enough, I'll work in your church. This is what's happening all over the world. And it was foretold by Paul. And it's something that Timothy was already dealing with some 500, I know more than that, probably, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, 1600 years ago. I don't know exactly when this was written. And who is he talking to here? He's talking to a pastor who works in a church. The greatest enemy of Christianity is not atheism. The greatest enemy to Christianity is not the agnostics, the skeptics, and the evolutionists. Not even immorality. The, the greatest enemy of the Christian church is the person who goes to church every week, sins and prays and testifies, but does not live according to the word of God. For that person leaves the church, walks around for six days, and does whatever he or she wants, and comes back and, holy, 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 and put the money in the plate and then they pray and I believe that's why we're losing our young people by the way I believe that's why we're losing our young people in the churches by thousands they're disgusted 
They will hear all this profession, but they don't see it lived. It is not demonstrated amongst the people who go to church. You see, people who go to church care more about politics, care more about finances versus humility and admitting that they need Jesus Christ in their lives. And admitting that the truth is what sets us free. People are sick to see politics in the church ahead of principle or money ahead of humility. What sets up this environment are pastors and leaders who feed people fables and good stories. But when they're challenged with the truth, they will say every single time, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that you love Jesus. I wrote here in my notes, preaching the truth in 2020 is not easy. That's wrong. Preaching the truth at any time in human existence is not easy. I really believe that we've come to a time, as predicted by Paul, where people just want to go to a place where they will have itchy ears. Just tell us what we want to hear and entertain us with good music and good programs. I can't bring God's standards down because we have sinful lives. The standards of men remain high and the Bible doesn't change. I need to change. And you need to change. But if we don't want to change, we just make this say whatever we want it to say so that we can feel good and not have to change. Let's go to the saddest verse in the Bible. Go to Matthew chapter 7. This is perhaps one of the, the saddest verses in the Bible. Matthew chapter 7. And so Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. So pretty much in the middle of your Bible, a little bit more than the middle of the Bible. He was one of Jesus' disciples. And in Matthew chapter 7, we start at verse 21. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Who's going to enter the kingdom of heaven? But he, who what? Does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have I not preached? I was talking to Tina this week, and I started to calculate how many sermons I've preached since I've been in this church. And we've calculated that it has to be, you know, over 500 sermons already. Have I not preached 500 sermons, dear God? Have I not cast out demons in your name? Have I not done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them that, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who what? You who practice lawlessness. So it means that you can preach, but if you don't live by the truth, it's worthless. This is a sad verse. This is a sad verse. Jesus says that the vast majority of religious people and pastors who sing, pray, cast out devils, and do miracles in Jesus' name, the majority of them will be lost. Even though they think that they're saved. What's the reason? According to this verse, not everyone who says all these things, but the ones who do the will of my Father and because they practice lawlessness. 
Folks, this is serious. This is a New Testament text. A lot of people like to say that the law has been done away with. This is a New Testament text. What does it mean to do the will of the Father? Let's just, we're going we're gonna to take this apart throughout this morning to figure out what that is. What does it mean to do the will of the Father? And the answer is found in the Bible. Again, I don't want to give you any of my answers. I want to give you the Bible answer. Go to Psalms 40. I'm going to put this one on the screen. Psalms 40, verse 8. This is written by David, a, 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 a man who was a shepherd. He went from shepherd to being a fugitive to being a king. And when he was a king is when he made the most mistakes. Psalms 40 verse 8 says, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. What does it mean to do the will of God? It means to keep his law. David knew that doing God's will was to have God's law written on our heart. By the way, the whole concept of the new covenant and the law being written on our heart, well, this is what God wanted to do with David and he was under the old covenant. And it's interesting, it says, I delight to do your will. If I was to ask a whole bunch of 10-year-olds in my church today, say, how many of you delight to do the will of your parents? I don't know how many of them would raise their hand. I'm not sure. But I can tell you that by the time they get to 35, if their parents had rules and stuck to their guns, they're all going to say, I delight in the fact that my parents had rules. We don't always necessarily appreciate it at the time. So God's will, in my opinion, is to do his law. When you give your life to God, and I'm just starting to experience this, and I've been in the church for a long time. His law is good. His law is a delight. I would even say his law is breathtaking. I'd like to clarify something this morning because I know we have people from all religious backgrounds watching this morning. Many of us would agree that keeping the law makes us a good citizen, right? If you keep the law... You know, you, you're, you're a good citizen. In religious people of all religions, there are two approaches to doing good. Two approaches. And I think that this mindset is also prevalent in non-religious people as well. Number one, the one camp believes that in order for God to love us, we have to be good. You've heard of that before? Right? In order for God to love you, you have to be good. This is, this is like the Romans and the Greeks and, and, and all the way back. You, know, you, have to, you have to appease the gods. You have to please them. You know, so to one extreme, you have people who do penance. I know of people who walk with bleeding knees upstairs just to be able to, for God to see that they, they, they're sorry. I also know of places in the world where people will, 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 will put needles through their mouth and walk around with weights on both sides in the middle of the streets exposing their, their piety and their willingness to suffer for the gods. Somehow inflicting pain is, is something that God will look upon and say, wow, these people really love me. In some places, people give money and gifts and offerings and, 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 and all kinds of, also all, all kinds of practices. I mean, in the Bible, the Jews believed that practicing certain rituals was needed in order to please God. So if I could sum that up, I would call it righteousness by works. Doing what's right in order for him to like you. And then there's another camp which is predominantly taught by evangelicals and, and mainstream Christianity today. They believe that God no longer expects us to keep the law. It's all about Jesus and only Jesus. He did away with the law. We are no longer under the law. I just wanted to, to just to separate those two for you because some of you, this is a total foreign concept. You've never heard of this before, but it's very prevalent. And I believe this is 
Satan toying with God's truth and God's message. Because if you can get the churches and the religions to get it wrong, and because most people don't search for themselves, he's going to sway most of the people. This presentation today will tell you what the Bible teaches about the obvious opposite handling of the law. According to what we just read in Matthew, we have lots of religious people who are not keeping what I'm going to call the Ten Commandments of God, which is the law. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to rip this apart. Don't worry. I'm making a strong statement here without proving it, but we're going to get there. And because of this one situation, this one situation that Matthew talks about, most religious people will be lost even if they think that they're going to be saved. So with that background, let's go to one last text. This is in Hosea. Hosea is in the Old Testament. We call him a little prophet because the books are short and their message is short, but it's poignant nonetheless. And in Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 to 2, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. Therefore, you swear, and you lie, and you kill, and you steal, and you commit adultery. You break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. I'm telling you something, this sounds a lot like our world today. Our governments, our world, our companies, our families... They are all in turmoil. And I believe it's because we've forgotten God's law. There is no truth. There is no mercy or knowledge of God in our land. We are destroyed for the lack of knowledge of what this book says in all areas of life. The Decalogue is a fancy word for the Ten Commandments. By swearing, that's commandment number three. By lying, commandment number nine. By killing, commandment number six. By stealing, commandment number eight. And by adultery, commandment number seven. North America leads the world in all five of those categories. Yet, we are a Christian nation. At least the United States is. Canada may not claim to be, but we sure have a lot of churches and Christians in this country as well. You see, the reason why I want to talk about this today, and I'm so passionate about this, is because this is the key issue in the book of Revelation. But no one wants to talk about it. And most of Christianity will tell you that the law is no longer binding for us. And I believe that is the Antichrist message. That is the mark of the beast. And we're going to get into that in the future. It's interesting because all governments have laws. And they may be different, but all governments have laws. When I drive out of here this afternoon... I'm going to stop at a red light. I, I should stop at a red light. The law of the land requires that I stop. Why? Okay, safety. Can you imagine whatever city you live in right now, take out all the stop signs and all the red lights. Just, just imagine that for a minute. What would happen? Right? It almost seems like without laws, there would be no order. There would be no harmony. So whenever I, you know, sometimes there's, there's this term in Christianity called legalism, where people believe that, you know, this is a term that is used to say, to label people who believe that by keeping the law, they win God's favor. That's legalism, right? Right? 
Whenever I stop at a red light and I see somebody else stopping at a red light, I can go like this. So they pull down a window. Legalist! You're a legalist! You stopped at the red light. Legalist! You didn't take that candy bar because it's not yours. You're a legalist. We were so quick to label people who think that laws are binding to label them as legalists. Is it possible that some people keep the law out of love, not out of duty? Or just to be saved? That's my point today. God's government is no different than our laws. It is based on order and harmony. Take away the law, you remove order and harmony. And interestingly enough, this is what I find interesting. This law that I'm talking about is the only thing, the only thing in this whole book that was written with the finger of God. The only thing. That's what it says. Exodus 31, 18. And when he made an end of speaking with him, which is Moses, on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of tone, written with the finger of God. These ten commandments, God wrote them with his finger on a piece of stone. The devil hates God's law. If he can lead people to discredit it, you will never be able to have a relationship with God the way you should. This is why if there's Christians who teach us that the law is done away with, they are actually doing away with a genuine, deep, personal relationship with God. And I'll explain to you why. Satan was the first to break the law of God, right? It's been his studied effort to influence people to ignore it. Not just in the world, but in Christianity as well. As a matter of fact, you go back a hundred years, and especially in the States. I went to school there several years ago when I was younger. And you could pretty much walk in any church and you would find a big picture of the Ten Commandments somewhere. You would go to courthouses and you would find big pictures of Ten Commandments. Lawyers' offices, you would see a painting of the Ten Commandments. Not all the lawyers' offices, but some of them. I remember seeing one and one specifically in some people's homes as well, some Christians' homes. They were taught to our children and upheld by our society. There was less crime, higher morals, almost no adultery. Drinking was frowned upon. I don't know if you, if you look at history, you know, people had to hide. Gambling, they had to hide in places. And if they were caught, they would be charged. But not so anymore. As a matter of fact, in most Christian pulpits today, you're hearing the exact opposite. The law's been done away with. It's been nailed at the cross. The law is for the, is for the Jews only. We're Gentiles. We're under a new covenant. It's been abolished. I don't have to keep it anymore. Where's this coming from? And for this, we have to go way back. You remember in one of our my, my past presentations, we identified this little horn and the 10 marks of this little horn. Well, the mark number nine says they would think to change times and laws. You see, what I'm trying to help you understand today is that, and you remember we talked about, and we're gonna talk a lot more about this in, in later, later topics, so I, I might have to shake the dust off a little bit, but this little horn has been given power by who? You guys Remember? Who, gave, who gives the power to this little horn? The dragon. The dragon, which is Satan. And so this little horn here is doing the work of Satan. And one of the work is to change the concept of how we see the law of God. For centuries after it did this, and we looked at this as well, you can look at history, and Christians for centuries did not go along with the Antichrist kingdom. They fought it. 
But about 50 or 70 years ago, everything changed. We see a complete reversal in the Christian community. Exact same lie as the Antichrist kingdom. That the law is done away with and it's been abolished and it's nailed at the cross. And I know why they understand this and I know why they teach this. And I understand where the confusion can come. I hope you come next week because we're going to unravel this in detail. It is so clear. It is so beautiful. It moved my heart and I knew some of this stuff already. Because we have to make it clear and it has to come from the Bible. I don't care what the Antichrist says. I don't care about what the popular movements in Christianity say. I only care about what this Bible says. Especially when God took the time to tell us in the Bible that it will be this issue that will cause many to be lost and think that they are saved. I mean, some say that the law began with Moses and the Jews. I find this verse very interesting in Genesis 26. Genesis is the first book in the Bible. And it says, and I will make these talking, God's talking to Abraham. Abraham pre-existed Moses, pre-existed Israel. There was no such thing as a Jew in Abraham's time. There was no Israel. And he says, I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Think about it this way. If commandments didn't exist before Moses, then why would Satan be, why could God kick Satan out of heaven? There has to be some commandment for God to say, you can't be here anymore. Well, what did I do wrong? Well, you did this, 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 but you never told me. Abraham obeyed the commandments. It existed long before it was written on stones. Abraham followed God's law. So just to make sure people don't get confused, it specifically says the commandments. I mean, Lucifer sin, right? Thou shalt not covet. He wanted the throne of God. He also wanted to be God, the first commandment. And then the ninth commandment, he lied because he told the angels lies about God and a third of them believed him. And if one-third of the angels were cast out for breaking the law, you and I certainly aren't getting in by breaking it. So, this is an interesting question. I wish, I wish all of those of you watching, I could see you right now. If I was to ask the question, you know, how many of you really love the truth? You know, if, if I was to ask those who are here right now, one, two, three, four, five people, if, would you raise your hand if I asked you, do you love the truth? Raise your hand if you love the truth. So one, two, three, four, all of them. And I'm sure Anthony and James in the back would also raise their hand because I can't see them because they're hiding behind a glass. Are you sure you love the truth? Are you sure? Because some of your hand went up a little slower than the others. You're sure? All right, because listen to this verse, Psalm 119, 142 says, Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. If you love the truth, guess what else you have to love? The law. <laughs> the law of God. Christians will be the first to say that they love the truth. Then why are we trying to do away with it? I don't understand. If we love the truth and the truth is the commandments of God, then why would we try to do away with it? I know why. Because they're afraid of legalism. And I understand why. Because some people have done that. Some people have said, you have to take the Ten Commandments or else you're going to hell. And that's wrong. But it doesn't mean that we throw the baby out with the bathwater. We don't just get rid of the law because people have misused it. We just got to study and search so we understand what it is. I mean, the Bible says that his law is good. Romans 7 verse 12, it says, Therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. This is a New Testament verse, not an Old Testament verse. 
This is somebody who would have written this under the new covenant. Very few things in the Bible are called holy. And here he calls his law holy. Matthew 5. And I'm going through fast because I know I, I just take such a long time. But I, I, I just think it's important for me to just get the point across. Matthew 5, verse 17, all the way. It says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy it, but I came to fulfill it. And next week, the title of my sermon is Fulfillment in Jesus Christ. You're going to see exactly. It, it's so beautiful. That is one of the most beautiful messages I have ever studied. It's, it's amazing. It just moves my heart. Jesus didn't come to get rid of the stuff, but he came to fulfill it. He didn't come to destroy I want you to stay away from two types of Christians. The first one is the ones who tell you that you're saved from the law. And then the other one is the one who tells that you're saved by it. So then you're asking me, well, what kind of Christians are left? <laughs> stay away from those who tell you that you're saved from from it and stay away from those of you who tell you you're saved by it. What's left? Well, we have to answer two simple questions. Why do we have God's law and what is his purpose? Or why do we have to do the will of the Father and what is the purpose? In order for me to answer that question, I have to ask you another question. What is sin? And I know that, you know, many people may have many different um, definitions of this three little letter word. But again, I don't want to give you the definition. I want the Bible to give us the definition. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John is another little book. It's almost at the end of your Bible. 1 John, and I'm, I'm going to wait before I put it on the screen. I want you to look for it. Because I also, for those of you, you, you just, I heard that some of you just bought a Bible last week or the week before because you've been following these sermons. I want you to get used to, to searching for it. And of course, if you have it on a device, then you just have to put 1 John. Make sure you put 1 John because if you just put John, you're going to get somewhere else. It's the same guy who wrote the book, but he wrote different books. He wrote John, the fourth, fourth book of the New Testament, and he also first wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John right near the end of your Bible before Revelation. Go to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. This gives us the definition of what is sin. It says, Whoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. Now this is from the, the King James. If you're reading the New King James, it'll say, For sin is lawlessness. Um, but uh, I like here the fact that uh, it is transgression of the law. That's what sin is. And if you admit that you have sin, then you have to admit that there's a law. Because if there's no law, there's no sin. I know I'm getting kind of logical here, and I, I, I kind of I get lost in my own thoughts sometimes. Because... Without law, there's no sin, and there's no sin, there's no transgression. So saying that Jesus has done away with the law is saying that there's no sin. And you all admitted to me today that there's sin in this world. Well, the only way we would know that if, if there was a law. The Bible even says, and this is proof because I... Because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no sin there's no transgression right Romans 5 verse 15 if there's no law if 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 you do something wrong at home and mom punishes you for doing it but you didn't know that it was wrong and can she really punish you for doing it is she never told you that that's wrong not really right so the only way that you can that that, that you can know that something is wrong is if somebody told you that it's wrong 
I hope this is clear. That the law cannot be done away with. It can't be done away with because if it's done away with, there's no sin. Now the next question is, what is the purpose of the law then? Because so many people have misused it. So go to, stay in Romans and just go to Romans chapter 3. So just one chapter back, one page back or one click away back. And then we go to Romans chapter 3 verse 20. It's very interesting. It says, therefore... By the deeds of the law, no flesh will be made right in his sight or justified. For by the law is what? The knowledge of sin. Please, from this verse alone, tell me what the law does not do. What does the law not do? That's right. That's right. The law does not justify. Good answer. <laughs> now, according to this verse, what does the law do? Two very important points. The law does not justify. The law identifies. James 1, in your Bible, also near the end of your Bible, and then you'll have to go there with me because I don't have it on the screen. James chapter 1 really clarifies this. This is right after the book of Hebrews. It's near the end, just between Hebrews and 1 Peter. And so James chapter 1 explains this so clearly that we can't be mistaken. Verse 22 James chapter 1, I told you there'd be a lot of Bible verses because I don't want this to come from me. It has to come from the Bible. James chapter 1, verse 22, it says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. James chapter 1, verse 22 for if, verse 23, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he or she does. Let me um, try to illustrate this uh, at this time. This is something that I have never done before as a minister. Uh, I am actually going to openly sin before you right now. Uh, well, almost before you. Almost before you. So I'm uh, walking around and really enjoying uh, the, the beach today. And it, there is a beach back here. There's a baptistry back here. You can't see it, but I can. And, uh, and I happen to be able to see that there are some pretty ladies here uh, on the beach. And boy, oh boy, are the, do they have, I don't even know if they have any clothing on. There's barely anything on. I think they call those things bikinis. And my mind starts to wonder. And oh, man, am I enjoying this. They are just the prettiest. Woo! And then my mind starts to think about things I could do with them and things that I oh and, and then the next thing I know uh, there's things that are happening in my body that I cannot control and 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 and, and I am and I'm married and I'm starting to remember my wife I'm starting this 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 is this is more than I can handle what am I going to do about this and but I cave in this is beautiful. This is amazing. And uh, I'm going to have to make sure I mark this beach because I have to come back. Life is amazing. When you go to the beach, it's beautiful what you're able to do and, and the things you're able to see. And uh, why, 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 why are you laughing? <laughs> what's, what's the problem? <laughs> well, what, why, are you, why are you making fun of me? <laughs> I... Uh, I just came back from the beach. That's all. Um, no, no issues here, right? No issues here. Um, what? My face is dirty? 
What are you talking about? My face is not dirty. How many of you agree that my face is dirty? What? Everybody is raising their hands. I got news for you. I can't see it. How do I know that you're not just fooling me because you want to go home and have your pot roast for lunch and that this service is just getting a little too long? In order for me to see if I have dirt on my face, what do I need? Mirror. A mirror. I need a mirror. <laughs> so, I have one here. Let me have a look. Ooh, indeed. <laughs> kind of a Smurf-like sin <laughs> that I experience, I think. There's a little bit of, and there's even some sparkles there in this. So it's, it's a sparkly sin. It looks good. It's blue and it has some sparkles in it. Now, if I keep looking at this mirror long enough, will the dirt go away? The mirror is actually showing me that I have a dirty face. But am I able to look at it long enough and hard enough and close enough? And is the dirt going to go away? No. You're right, it can't. Now, I can get mad at the mirror and showing me my dirt and saying, let's get rid of this mirror. It's been done away with. Done. I don't need this thing anymore. I will need a broom, though. Now, that takes care of the problem, right? I can't see the dirt anymore. This is beautiful. This is a great way to, this is a great way to fix the problem. Somebody said in the back that it didn't fix the problem. It didn't fix the problem because I still need to get clean. I need to wash up. So that mirror did me a big favor. It showed me that I had dirt all over my face. But if I'm going to get clean, I have to put the mirror aside because it did its job. And then I have to go to the fountain. We sang about that fountain at the beginning of the service. The Bible calls it the fountain of blood. Now, please, don't take that literal. Obviously, if I go to a fountain of blood, it's not going to make my face any dirty, any cleaner. But what does it mean? I have to go to Jesus. He's the only one who can take the dirt away from my face. And so, I listened to a young French pastor in a church called Really Living for the last seven weeks. And I'm starting to hear about the fact that God wants to clean my heart. That God is willing to give his son to die for me. And as I start to experience this, and as I start to learn about what God has done for me, I start to do some interesting things. I repent, I confess, and I start to watch and pray. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to experience the love of God like I've never experienced it before. I'm starting to understand that I can't do it myself, but that he did it for me. And I start to rejoice in his salvation. Oh, there's something good about experiencing the love of God and knowing that I don't have to carry these burdens anymore. And I give my life to him. I watch and pray. And sometimes I make a little mistake here and there. But at the end of it all, I start to understand and realize that I'm saved by Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Is my face clean, yes or no? Is it clean, yes or no? How do I know? I can't see it. Maybe you're just saying yes to make fun of me. So when I walk out of here and I drive home and I stop at a red light, the person next to me is going to laugh as I call them a legalist. What do I need to know if my face is clean? But I did away with it. It's done. I don't need it anymore. Jesus did away with it. I can't see it. In order for me to see my face, I need a mirror. So I take out a mirror. Now, has this mirror changed from that one? Oh, I can actually flash some lights into people's faces. It's kind of cool. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, they're blinded. <laughs> No, it hasn't changed. But I don't like the mirror. It shows me my faults, and I've been saved by grace. But I take out this mirror, 
And indeed, the, the Smurf sin is gone. Poor Smurfs, they don't, they don't deserve this kind of treatment. But, and as I look at this mirror, I say, by the grace of God and by the blood of the Lamb, that sin is gone. I am clean. Funny looking, but clean. Yeah, that's really scary. That's the purpose of God's law. When you look into his Ten Commandment law, it gives you a knowledge of sin. Let's say I'm a thief. And as I read the Bible, I come across this law. I recognize that what I'm doing is wrong. The law is educating me on my sin. It tells me I have dirt in my life, but I can't clean myself up. I have to go to my Savior and let his blood clean me. Folks, I am a walking testimony that there are certain sins that I have prayed over and tried to fight by myself until I gave them to Jesus and now they are gone. I couldn't do it. But I, for 21 years of my Christian walk, I tried to fight it all by myself and I failed every single time. I repent, I confess, and then I go back to the law and I read that thou shalt not steal and I can say because of the grace of God, I no longer steal and I stand clean and uncondemned. The purpose of God's law, if you do away with the God's law, listen, this is serious. If you do away with God's law, you do away with the only purpose of leading you to Christ. So, let's go have a look at these Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus. You have your Bibles, you go to the book of Exodus. It's the second, it's right at the beginning, uh, right at the beginning of the Bible. And if you go to it, go to Exodus chapter 20. Because I want you to tell me, by the time we're done reading these Ten Commandments, I want you to tell me if you feel that one of them is wrong or one of them shouldn't be there. Um, you know, if any of them will hurt you or would hurt other people. So let's go to it. Exodus chapter 20. And, um, and we're going to go through them one by one because some of you may have never read this before. Number one says what? You shall have no other gods before me. This is Exodus 20 verse 3. God loves you and made you. And if you put him first in your life, you're going to have an incredibly Abundant life here and ultimately in eternity. God is to your life what water is to your life. And we can have all kinds of gods, can't we? It doesn't have to be a wooden thing in your house that you're worshiping. It could be... It, it, the biggest God we have is us. That's why I is right in the middle of sin. It could be our children. It could be our pride. It could be our material things. I heard somebody quote in earlier today, it says, Show me all the toys. When people die and say, show me all the toys you have. Whoever has the most toys has the victory. It's not true. Second commandment. Thou shalt not make unto you any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, in the earth beneath, or is in water under the earth, and shall not bow down to them, or you shouldn't serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and do what? Keep my commandments. Man, this is, this, this, this breaking of this commandment is prevalent in most religions today and in Christianity as well. The bottom line, why would you worship the created when you can worship the creator? Why do we lower 
the standards to worship a stone, a fish, a fly, or a bird, or a, a statue of a big, jolly, overweight man. That was created. The creator is the one that deserves all the glory. Number three, thou shalt not taint the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless and takes who takes his name in vain. Whether it's with our mouths, with cussing and swearing, or with our actions, I'll never forget this. I was driving in Atlanta, and even for a Quebecer, it's scary to drive in Atlanta. And um, I was driving in Atlanta, and cars were passing me by, and I, w- I, was not, I did not feel safe. It, people drive, drove very fast on that day. Maybe there's a fire behind me, and I didn't see it, but people were passing me, and then one guy actually rolled down his window and went like this to me. I'm thinking to myself, what's, I know I had a Quebec plate. Maybe they didn't like Canadians. I don't know. But then as he passed me by, I saw there was a Jesus fish. And on it, it says, Jesus loves you. And I'm thinking to myself, there's something wrong here. You know, I think that that's taking the, name, the Lord's name in vain. You claim to be a Christian, a Jesus who loved and died for people, yet you go around and treat them like dirt. I'll never forget that bumper sticker. <laughs> Jesus loves you with a fish on it. I didn't feel loved at all when you drove by and did that to me, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, if we claim to be disciples of Jesus and we don't like, act like one, then we take his name in vain. The next one is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it. That's the fourth one. Six days you shall labor and do all your works, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath, the Lord your God. And in it you shall do no work nor your son, nor your daughter, nor the people who serve you, whether man or woman, nor even your cattle, or the people who were visiting you for the weekend. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the the sea and all that is in them, and then he rested on the seventh day, and he blessed the day, and he hallowed it, or he made it holy. If God rested at creation, then don't you think that we need it more than he does? I think it's one of the reasons why our society is so uptight. We, I mean, we're under the gun seven days a week. He says, I want you to take a day off. I want to tell you which one, the seventh day. Take it off. I mean, this one's for the children. Number five, honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And, you know, I want to say something because a lot of people who I have been ministering to over the years tell me, Francis, I have a problem with this one because my mom and dad abandoned me. Or my mom hates me and my dad hates me. And, you know, sometimes to honor someone like that is to keep your safe distances. Because sometimes when you get close, you can get really hurt or you can do something that you would never want to do. And one day, one day the Lord will lead you. I had one person, I told that advice to her. And 17 years later, 16 years later, she called me and says, I finally reconnected with my, parent, my mom and I'm able to do it with dignity. She would not have been able to do it with dignity 17 years earlier. 17 years earlier. And so sometimes to honor them is just to give them their space. You know who you are. You know what they've done. Sometimes you don't want to necessarily relive something that really, really hurt you. Uh, number six, thou shalt not kill. Think of the world what it would be if there was no killing, no murder, no hatred, no harm, no pain for the families that are left behind. You heard about this accident that just happened, right, with a mother and three of her daughters passed away because of a reckless driver. This one alone, if we kept it, would bring so much more peace in our world. No war. Next one. Thou shalt not commit adultery. How many homes will not be broken today? How many men and women would do diligence before they get married? People jump into relationships way too fast. AIDS and STDs are costing billions all around the world because the sanctity of marriage and sex between two people who have committed their lives to one another and have taken the appropriate steps to learn about relationships before sex, they just shack up and just... It's all been... 
all too forbidden. Movies and TVs make fun of this and, 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 and feature it and glamour having sex before you're married. And you are allowing your children to watch that. So you're going to tell them that they can't have sex before they get married, but then you allow them to watch that crap? What are they going to do? Which one's more appealing? We have to be so careful. They are learning sin and they think it's normal. What about stealing? Number eight, thou shalt not steal. Again, how many of us have felt the violation of entering your home? This happened to my family. We were living and behind our home, there was a huge field, so it's easy for somebody to come in. We walked into our house, lamps were on the floor, drawers were open, clothes everywhere. You walk into your home and you see this, you feel so violated. I never felt violated like that before. And it marked me. Even now sometimes when I put things in my house, I try to hide them. I, you know, you get this reflex. Man, number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. Basically, don't lie. I read a book not that long ago, and I even used it in one of my sermons. It's called The Honest Truth About Dishonesty. How we lie to everyone, especially ourselves. And this book, if you have a chance, read it. Dan, Dan Ariarelli is a, is a social scientist, really good writer, good, good book. And it really shows how, as a society, we've become accustomed to white lies. We've become accustomed to just, it's okay. It's okay to do this because everybody else does it. Everybody else thinks that way. Very interesting. And last but not least, um, thou shalt not covet. I mean, marketing companies make money on covetousness. That's why they pay during a Super Bowl, they will pay over a million, three million, four million dollars for 30 seconds of your time because they know that if you see it, you'll want it. I, I, I'm, uh, I like to dabble in woodworking. I used to do it more. But I don't know if any of you have ever seen this or if just an algorithm that's, that is targeting me. But when I go on Facebook... There's this advertising of this tool that you can use that you push it against an edge that is uneven and it'll give you the shape. You can lock it in that shape so then you can cut your wood. And I, every time I see that, I'm tempted because I like woodworking. And I, they must have, I, I need, have you guys ever seen it on Facebook when you're on there? No, so it is an algorithm. So they, they must have seen me look for something on woodworking or like I hate how this somebody behind me is actually knowing what I want and and it's, it's, I mean, I, Tina and I have just been searching for cars for the last two weeks, and now I'm getting all kinds of car advertising on every platform that I go on to. It's ridiculous. Somebody's watching us. You got to be careful with this. But they know exactly what we want, and it feeds that covetousness of wanting what your neighbor has. In this case, even worse, his wife or, his hus or her husband. Uh, anything that people have, covetousness. Now, 10... After reading these Ten Commandments, do you find anything wrong with them? Do you, do you believe that if society lived according to these, we would live in a better place? In my humble opinion, these Ten Commandments make more sense than anything on this earth today. If, as a society, we kept those ten simple principles, I think we would be happier, we'd be more fulfilled, and we'd be united. We wouldn't need jails, security guards, police officers, less nurses and doctors, fewer lawyers. Politicians would actually work for people instead of themselves. And we would be in a world without borders. Ten simple statements written with the finger of God. Man. You go to the Judicial Library in Toronto. Five floors of books, all with laws. Five floors. Here, ten. Ten commandments that make more sense than some of the modern psychology nonsense babble that we hear that's come out over the last 20 years. So then the last question is, how can we keep them? Because if you've read this list, 
I'm sure some of you are like, whoop, yeah, broke that one. Yeah, that one. That one just this morning as I got up. And that one I was about to go and break after the sermon. Now I'm going to have to reconsider. There are hundreds and hundreds of verses in the Bible that talk about God falling in love with us. But there's only one Bible verse in the Bible that talks about our love for him. I never realized that. You know which one it is? If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, verse 15. It's so simple. Think about it. Do you want your children to listen to you out of duty or out of love? Do you want them to fear you when they do something? Or do you want them to do it because they love you? Oh, I better do it or else. Or, you know what? Dad gave me this counsel and I know dad loves me because every morning he comes and he, he wakes me up and he lies in bed with me and he plays around the bed sheets and then at night he comes and reads me a story. I know dad loves me. And if he's telling me to do this, it's because he loves me. I'm going to do it because I love him too. God doesn't say, if you love me, give me money. He doesn't say that. Or give me your time. Or give me your rituals. Just just keep my commandments. Obey me. Because I know what's good for you. Look at it this way. I think the Ten Commandments are a test of love. Do we love Jesus or do we love sin? If you go, let's go to John 14. Because we also have, I want to read verse 16 and 17. John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17. So we read, if you love me, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And in verse 16, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. You see, you can't keep the commandments of God without the help of the Holy Spirit or the helper. You can't. But he wants you to keep the commandments when you have that, relation, that love relationship with him. Keeping the commandments is what allows you to have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps you to understand. And then that's what leads us to truth. In verse 21 of the same chapter, it says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Every verse that we've read so far about the commandments are bathed in the word love. And just, just to show you how smart I am, okay, the Greek word here is agape. Agape I mean, the Greek have several words for love. They have philos, which is a brotherly love. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. They have eros, right? That is a, that's a, a physical attraction. And then they have agape, which is described as unconditional love, which means you love no matter what. You love with expecting nothing in return. Many see the commandment keepers as legalists, which is a fancy word for people who are trying to get their way into heaven, to work their way into heaven. Is love legalist? If I choose to keep the seventh commandment that says that I should not commit adultery, I choose to be faithful to my wife that God has gifted to me. Am I legally trying to work my way to heaven? Some may. Some may just love their wife because that's what God told them to do. 
but not me. <laughs> she, she is an intentional and most precious gift from God to me. In giving her to me, God loved me. And in return, I love him by treating her with respect and not committing adultery. Keeping my eyes and my heart locked on her and her only. All because God loved me by giving her to me. Benton, you're a lucky man because your wife is shaking her head as I'm sharing this, which means she probably feels the same way about you. <laughs> That's what Jesus says when he says, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do you realize that this is supposed to be the new covenant that people talk about? But it's simply the Ten Commandments broke down into two. The first four is loving the Lord and the last six are loving your neighbor. Or we talk about this golden rule, right? Treat other people as you would like to be treated. That's all Ten Commandments. Love is not legalism. It simply means that you're totally committed to Jesus Christ and you hate sin and you love God and you love your neighbor. I like this verse in 1 John 5, 2 to 3. It says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and we keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not a burden. It's almost as if true love for God is shown in a humble willingness to admit that his commandments are binding for me. That if you're not willing to admit that his commandments are binding for you, you actually don't love him. That's pretty serious. And if Satan has done a work in convincing, I can't say a number because I don't know, but most of religious people to do away with the law, what does that say about their relationship with God? What does that say about my relationship with God? I have met many Christians who have told me that it's impossible to keep the Ten Commandments. I say, yeah, you're right. On your own. Even after I showed them all of these verses that I've shown you today, some of them get angry at me. And they tell me it's impossible. Does God want us to keep the Ten Commandments? Yes or no? Yes. We saw that today. Does he understand if we fall at keeping them? Yes or no? Yes. He understands. Does he understand if we deny their authority on us? No. That he does not understand. I told a, a minister once, uh, we were talking about this, and um, he told me, you know, Francis, it's impossible. And so I started talking with him, and I said, you know, I, I know why you feel that way. Um, I know that in your church, whenever the money plate is passed around, and it ends up in your office, you take some of it with you, and you take it home. He goes, no, by no way. I wouldn't do that. That's wrong. I said, well, you keep one of them. And I says, but I know, I know. I'm, okay, it's not the money thing, but I saw the administrative assistant you have in your office. Young, vibrant, very talented and gifted. And I know that you've probably have committed adultery with her. And so, you know, that he goes, no, are you kidding? I love my wife. I've been married for, for 35 years. I would never do that. So, well, you keep two of them. And I said, yeah, I know. When you drive home, 
You probably swear at people when you're driving because they cut you off or they, you know, and you, no, no, I don't do that. I don't take them. I, I don't do that. That's wrong. I said, well, you keep three of them. The bottom line is that it really ruffles our feathers when commandments go against what we want to do. So it's much easier to just go along with the Antichrist kingdom and say that the law's been done away with. It's much easier to preach that this than to point out the word of God and what it says that sin is breaking the law. We're going to learn more about this and next week because I really believe that this is the key issue in the book of Revelation. I really believe that this is the key issue about the end of the world. I don't want to waste your time. I want you to see what is really happening around us today. 1 John chapter 2 is so clear, it's almost scary. And again, I want to let you know, I've been using a lot of New Testament verses because a lot of people teach that we're under the New Testament, the New Covenant, and they all say that the commandment stuff is in the Old Testament, but look at 1 John 2. 1 John 2, verses 3 to 4. It says, now by this we know that we love him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Which means that if someone does not believe in keeping all ten commandments, the truth is not in them. I'm not saying keeps all ten commandments because we, we break them. We make mistakes. We fall to the temptation of the devil. But someone who does not admit that, that the Ten Commandments are binding for us today, the Bible says the truth is not in them. Keeping them doesn't mean that you never make a mistake. Keeping them means that you know they're binding and you want to live by them. That's what it means when it says keeping them. Keeping is another word for guarding. You're guarding them. These are valuable and they're binding for me. That's that's what the word keep means, both in Hebrew and in Greek. I'm not saying this. This is God saying this, not me. I don't care if it's a church, a pastor, a a television ministry, or your best friend. But if they tell you that you don't have to keep the law or that the law's done away with, the Bible says they're liars and the truth is not in them. Some say all you have to do is believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Well, guess what? James chapter 2 verse 19 says the devil believes. You believe that there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and they tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? You can say you believe all you want. Show me if you're willing to put action to your words. Is the devil going to be saved? Yes or no? No, the Bible is very clear why he believes in God. Why shouldn't he be saved? He believes in God. Belief is not enough. It's the first step, but if you truly believe, you're going to do something about it. Let me illustrate this. Almost a year ago, I'll, I'll never forget this. I was standing here. The first sermon I ever preached in this church. Some of you may remember what happened. I was preaching and, and, and I was on, I was so excited to be in our new building. I was preaching and I taught, I even specifically says, and fire came down from heaven and the fire alarm went off in the whole building. And to my surprise, the 200 people stayed in their seats. Why? 
Because they didn't believe there was a fire. There was 200 people in here, probably 30 or 40 children, and not even one of them ran out of their classrooms. But I'll tell you something. I have an advantage over you. I'm standing right here. You don't see what's happening in that corner right above where Melissa's sitting. But let's say I was standing up here and I started to see some smoke come down from the ceiling there because the unit is just right there. The unit that cools or heats this place and all of a sudden there was some oil that was dripping down and there was fire on that oil and it was dripping down on those seats and I said, fire, get out! Look, look! And everybody looks, what are they going to do? They're going to get out. Why? They believed. They believed. I couldn't believe nobody got up the first time. If we ever do a fire drill, you better get up. <laughs> I'm telling you right now. Belief has in it the germ of action. If you believe, you're going to do something about it. And a lot of people begin to live a healthier lifestyle after they've been diagnosed with a life altering disease they've heard about the consequences of not exercising they've heard about the consequences of smoking they've heard about the consequences of drinking alcohol they've heard about the consequences of sitting on your couch all day and watching football games but you don't even know how to throw a pigskin they've heard about all these different things but it isn't until they get a diagnosis that they start changing their lives why maybe they didn't believe but all of a sudden they start to believe and they start to do something about it. That's why when you believe and you love Jesus, you will keep his commandments. But I'm afraid too many of us don't believe and circumstances may have to get dire for us to change. I wish it wasn't so, but the Bible predicts that it will be. And we're going to talk a lot more about that in the next four weeks. Look at these verses. This is talking about end time people. The people, we, we learned last week that end time began when? Anybody remember? Yes, I can hear you screaming at the screen right now. 1844! 175 years that we've been living in the end time. And look how the Bible describes God's end time people. In Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was enraged with the woman. We're going to talk about this. And he went to make war with the rest of her offsprings. We're going to talk about them too. And what is the rest of her offsprings? Because this is the final battle of the devil. This is the last people he's going to try to get. Those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And then after that, in Revelation 14, 12, says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And the last book, last chapter in the Bible, Revelation 22, 14, says, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the rights to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. I think that keeping the commandments of God is something that is relevant even to this day. Not for salvation purpose, but for peace and mind, both in ourselves and within our world. Over and over again, God's people in the last days are known as commandment keepers. They have the faith of Jesus and follow the Bible and the Bible alone, having nothing to do with the beast, its image, and its mark. Friends, I have gone over 25 to 30 verses today to prove to you that this is true but to close I have to switch to the other side because as I have talked to many people about this issue of law and grace I have found out that people always ignore the verses that I just mentioned to you today and they use two or three verses to prove their point now next week we're really going to hash this out but I just wanted to look at a couple of them now. I'm not going to discuss them, but I know that some of you who believe in, I, I spoke to somebody two weeks ago who, who used this verse, Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 14. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made a life together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having it nailed to the cross. Folks, does this talk about the Ten Commandments? Is the word Ten Commandments there anywhere? 
We're going to talk about that next week. You can have 20. I, I have found out now, this is why I don't want to fight anymore. I found out that you can give 20 to 30 verses to someone and they're going to read this one and they're going to tell me that the law's done away with. They throw all the other verses out the window. Well, we'll talk about that next week. There's another one that says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. There's another one in Ephesians 2.15. This is having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create it himself, one new man from the two, thus making peace. Another one says, you shouldn't tell people what to drink, what to eat, or what day to worship. Also in Colossians chapter 2, we're going to talk about that next week too. That one is thrown at me all the time. Every time I bring up that fourth commandment, people say, oh, Colossians chapter 2 says, you shouldn't tell me what day to keep. And, we'll get, and you know what? I understand why they get that. I get it. But next week, I hope today was enough, but next week is definitely going to show you guys, again, one of the most beautiful, beautiful, beautiful messages. Every single one of us has broken God's law. We are all under the condemnation of death because that's the penalty for breaking the law. The only way you and I can get out of it is if the judge gives us a pardon and he, and he says, I give you grace. I pray that over the last few weeks, you have tasted the grace of God. That you know that your sin is not bigger than his pardon. And now that you've tasted that grace, it means that you are no longer under the condemnation of the law. Follow this very carefully. You are no longer under the condemnation of the law, but grace does not mean that you're no longer under the obligation of it. See the difference? You are no longer under the condemna condemnation of the law, but we are still under the obligation of it. Take away all the red lights, take away all the stop signs and see what happens. Take away God's law, which is what's happening. We're choosing preachers that give us itchy ears. That we're choosing teachers that will teach us the things we want. And guess what? We're messed up. Churches are messed up. Church members are messed up. Did you know that our young people, now more than ever, want churches to give them the truth and the cold, hard truth instead of just, they're sick and tired of fluff. And so are you, as a matter of fact. That's why you've been listening to this now for eight weeks in a row. Because I'm just giving you what's in the Bible. And you, you are under the obligation of the law, but not because you have to, but because you want to. Because you're falling in love with Jesus Christ, your Savior, who has done everything for you, including giving his life. Because the law of God will bring harmony in your life. Because it was written with the finger of God. Sin leads to law. Law leads to grace. And grace leads to love. It's the only way it can go. Take away any of those components. Take away the law. You have nothing. That's the difference. We're no longer the condemnation of the law but we're still under its loving obligation. All God wants is your love, and he initiated it with grace to lead you to it. Grace will lead you to the law. When you realize you've done something wrong, then you go to the one who's going to forgive you, and then you're going to fall in love because he forgave you for something you've done, sometimes willfully or not willfully. That's why we can't do away with the law. Only when you know you've done something wrong will you run to the only one who can help you overcome it. And trust me, that is true. You cannot overcome sin without the help of Jesus. I haven't been able to, but I have been able to with his help. So if you love him, you're going to keep his commandments. Next week, we're going to tackle those difficult verses and hopefully put this idea of legalism to rest one and for all. It'll be entitled fulfillment in Jesus Christ.
Father in heaven. Wow. Your Bible has been so clear today to help us understand that perhaps we have been misusing this law. Either we use it to judge other people, which is wrong. Perhaps we use it to judge ourselves harshly and we always feel depressed and unworthy. That's wrong too. But if we're able to just allow the law to lead us to the only one who loves us no matter what we've done, that is ultimately the purpose of the law. Oh Lord, help us. This world is more than willing to lead us astray, to lead us away from the only one who loves us. And I hope that today, as we've understood this now, we're not afraid of the commandments. We're not afraid of the law because it's for our good and it's, 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 it's for our, our, our balance in our own lives and in the lives of those around us. It's possible that other people may not treat us with respect that may break the law in our presence, but we want to make a commitment today. We want to make a commitment today, Father, that we are asking you to help us through the Holy Spirit to keep the law of God. Help us to develop a loving relationship with you. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works that anyone can boast, but you created those works around us so that we can do good works for you and for people around us. Thank you for opening our eyes and our mind to this this morning. In your name I pray, amen.